All right, we're back. This unit's all about inheritance. In our last video, we learned about polymorphism, which is going to tie in to what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about object. Not objects, but object. A class that exists in Java. And then we'll get into casting objects, which is something you can do. We've seen casting before, dealing mostly with ints and doubles. But now with polymorphism, casting becomes a thing that we need to talk about. We're also going to start overriding the equals method, which will likely come in a later video. In Java, if a class does not explicitly extend another class, it will implicitly extend the object class. What do I mean? Well, we wrote this whole person hierarchy, right? Where I got person at the top and then student, college student, teacher is underneath person, student is extending person. That is happening explicitly. Person isn't extending anything except what our slide here is saying is that if a class doesn't extend something explicitly the way that student does it will implicitly extend object okay so student is explicitly extending person person is actually extending object a class that exists in java so what it means is our hierarchy technically looks more like this i have student extending person and person is implicitly extending object. Ultimately, what this means is that object is at the top of every class hierarchy. All the classes we have written, right? We just got introduced to inheritance. We just started extending, but we've been writing, you know, like card classes. Did we write a card? I don't know. Yeah, with blackjack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blackjack that card class that was extending object that your all of your drivers are technically extending object everything is extending object it is at the top of the class hierarchy object it's a it's a class that exists and it defines some methods ultimately since this is at the top of every hierarchy all of those methods are inherited they exist across all of the classes you write period the methods defined in object will be inherited by all the subclasses in the class hierarchy. Note that object doesn't define any instance variables, so we're not inheriting any wacky instance variables. So the question then is, what can I do? What kind of methods you got for me? All right, here is a object API. It is a literal class that exists in Java, part of java.lang. Java.lang is the default Java library, right? Stuff that is in this package doesn't need to be imported. That includes string. That includes um, your math class. That includes the integer object, the double object, those wrapper classes. All of those are in java.lang. Here's our constructor. That's it. <laughs> There's a no arcs constructor, which makes some sense. Why does the no arcs constructor make sense? Why does the existence of it matter? I'm going to open up person. Right? Person, not extending anything, right? Except it is technically implicitly extending object. That is actually happening there. You can actually explicitly do that, by the way. We can do this. IntelliJ is going to tell me that you don't need to do that. Right? That's what the yellow means. It's kind of a caution. You don't have to do this because we are implicitly doing it, but you can. So we are extending object. Why does the existence of this NoR constructor make a lot of sense? What's the first thing that a subclass constructor must do? It has to call the super class constructor, right? Right here is an implicit call to super. What is the super class of person? It's object. We're actually calling this constructor. Same thing down here. You could explicitly write it too. We are calling the superclass constructor and the superclass is object. Now there's no instance variables, so it doesn't actually do anything, but it is at least cohesive with what we've been, you know, working with. There is an implicit call to the superclass constructor. And as it turns out, person does have a superclass. Okay. Method summary. Here we go. Notice there, there's nothing about instance variables. There are none. Object doesn't give you any additional instance variables. But there are some methods, such as clone, which we'll actually talk about. Equals. That's interesting. Um, get class. We're actually going to talk about that one. 
two string, bah, 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 arguably like the one that's just going to make your brain click. Uh, some of these weights, I wouldn't worry about them. Like half of these, I don't even know what they do. Like finalized, I for sure don't know what it does. Called by the garbage collector when an object blah, 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 determines there are no more references to it. So I think that's whenever the garbage collector says, yeah, it's time for you to go. Whatever. All right. So what does this give us? That's cool and all, but what does it give us? Let's talk about these four methods in particular. A couple of objects methods such as equals and two string aren't very useful in their own right. For instance, the equals method to find an object merely compares the two objects using the equals relational operator. That is, it checks their references. When I, whenever we were dealing with strings, I told you to use the equals method in order to compare them. Don't use the equals relational operator. Later on, we learned whenever we were looking at pointers and null, that what this does whenever you're comparing objects, it checks to see are their references the same. Let's quickly recap what I'm talking about. I'm in my driver. I'm going to delete this stuff. I'm going to make a couple of person objects. We got P1. It's going to be a new person. I'm going to make person P2. And that's going to be a new person. And I want to know, is P1 equal to P2? There goes that IntelliJ yellow highlight again. If I scroll over this, new object is compared using equals. Okay, what's the big deal? Let's run our driver here. What do you expect? A true or false value? False? What are you talking about? They're both going through the exact same constructor, right? If I look at P1, uh, P1, oh, what are you doing? P1. And I look at P2. They're being constructed the exact same way. They should have the exact same state. I'm going to call their two strings to look at all of the instance variables. Bruh. It's the same person. This is checking the references. It's saying, is P1 pointing at the same thing that P2 is pointing at? The answer is no. They're pointing at two different objects. Okay. So this checks the references. If I were to say P2 is equal to P1, here I am saying I want P2 to point to the same thing that P1 is pointing at. Now, they are, of course, going to have the same state because it's literally the same object. I got two variables pointing at the same object. There's only one object there. So true, yeah, those two variables are pointing at the same thing. So that is what we're actually checking when we use the equals relational operator. What our slides are telling us is the equals method that we saw in object just does that. Womp womp, right? If I say, are these things equal? Is P1 equal to P2? I should get a true value here because, yeah, they're pointing at the same thing. But what if I bring back P2 as a new person? Are those things equal? False. All right. If this just does what the equals relational operator does, then why does it exist? We'll talk about that a little bit later. I was just proving the point that the equals method just does what the equals relational operator was. And we got a pretty solid recap on that equals relational operator. Equals and two string were really meant to be overridden by subclasses in the class hierarchy, right? This thing exists, yeah, but it's meant to be overridden. What? Okay, why even have it at all? Think about this. Nah, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it. It's meant to be overridden. The two string, kind of a similar thing. Okay, think about this. I'm back in person. I'm going to delete the two string, right? I'm going to comment this bad boy out. Right now, person doesn't have a two string. So what happens whenever I print a person. We've encountered this issue a lot. I get this garbage, right? And I told you it's the memory reference. It's effectively the hexadecimal location in, in RAM, in memory. Where's this coming from? 
I didn't get an error. It's not a syntax error. If I try to call any other method, it doesn't exist. Get fish. It's a syntax error. Here, I am trying to basically call toString, but person doesn't have a toString, except it does. We are extending object. Object has a toString. Oh, I lost my API. Oh, I could have minimized and found it. There's a toString inside of object. Okay. That is where this is coming from. Now, it doesn't seem very useful, does it? Except think about this. Whenever I try to print an object as such, we are implicitly calling a toString, right? You know this, right? What I'm actually saying here, p1.toString. Java is able to do this. Java is able to do this, I should say, because it knows everything has a toString. It is able to basically implicitly make this call. It is able to implicitly call the toString because it knows everything. Your stupid card class that you made, the blackjack class that I didn't finish the videos on, everything that we've ever made is ultimately beneath object in the class hierarchy, which means everything you've ever made, including this driver, right? This driver is technically extending object. Everything you've ever made is extending object, which means everything you've ever made actually has a two string, which means that whenever you try to print an object, we can assume that you're trying to do the two string because it knows, yeah, it's there. Everything's got a two string. I can do this. That's kind of cool. That is why two string exists. That is why you would write a method, an object that doesn't really do anything because there's at least something there. Kind of cool. Other methods such as get class and clone are actually useful to us without having to override them with our own implementation. So get class, in our last video, I told you, uh, we talked about the difference between compile time and runtime of an object. And that is derived from the fact that we can have um, different variables referencing different objects. What do I mean? person person is a new student we learned about polymorphism in our last video we are able to do this because student is beneath person in the class hierarchy right student is a person student extends person student is a person the vice versa doesn't work, right? If I tried to, you know, store, if I tried to make a student, I don't even know what I'm fat fingering there. Student, Stu is a new person. This doesn't work because person's higher in the class hierarchy, okay? All right, this is from polymorphism. I'm able to do this, but what happens is I now have two data types that are relevant. I have the data type of the variable, which we will call compile time data type. I have the data type of the object, which is the runtime data type. With polymorphism, I'm able to pass this thing into a method that accepts all person objects, right? This will take in any person. That is a person, of course. That is a student. It's a teacher. Anything that is beneath person in the class hierarchy can be passed in to this method, even though it only takes a person. How is that useful? How is that good? Well, I don't have to override the method, right? In the past, we would have had to made a, make a checkout method for each of these things, student. That becomes problematic because these checkout methods, right? One for person, one for student, one for college student, one for teacher, they will likely have duplicate code. I'm just talking about checking out a book, right? They're gonna have a lot of duplicate code. So instead, we can condense the duplicate code into one method that takes in a single person. But what this means is what's coming in is not necessarily a person. That is where get class comes in. That allows me to check the runtime class. I know the compile time class. It's going to be a person. I will be able to call person methods. 
the compile time class, uh, the compile time data type tells us what we can call. These are person methods. I don't see anything about student. I don't see anything about college student. I don't see anything about teacher. How would it know about those things? All we know is that this thing is at least a person. So we're only able to call person methods. But it could be something else. That's where get class is at. Get class returns the runtime class of this object. Now, this is a little bit annoying. There is in Java, God bless its heart. There is in Java a class called class. Not making this up. Not making this up. If I go here and I click on this, it's going to take me to the class API. We have class, class. Notice that it is beneath object in the class hierarchy, of course. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about what this object is. In fact, we're not even really going to use it. Now that we're coding with inheritance and using polymorphism to our advantage, get class is useful as we can dynamically determine the type of object, right? So here I have a person variable. The compile time data type of P is person. The runtime data type, the data type of the object is student. I can do p.getClass and that is going to return the runtime data type, the class of the runtime data type. I'm saving that into a class variable and then printing it off. It will literally say class student. Okay, how is that useful to us? Consider that checkout method that I've been referencing. I don't know what the person is coming in. It could be a student. It could be a teacher. I'm going to say p.getClass dot get name. This is P is a person object. I'm going to call get class. P can call this. Why? Get class is a method that is an object. Object is going to return a class object, right? So P dot get class is a class. I'm taking that class object and doing get name, right? If I take a quick look back at that class API, there is a get name, which is just giving me back a string. Returns the name of the entity. The class ignores some of these other things, uh, represented by this class object as a string. So in our previous slide, we saw that if we just print the class itself, we get class student. If I do get name, it's giving me just this part. That's all. Don't, don't overanalyze this. Why is this useful? Why do I care? I know this is at least a person. I don't know what type it is exactly. I don't know what the runtime data type is. Just looking at the definition. This is where these terms come from. Compile time, runtime. Looking at this at compile time in the compiler in, in IntelliJ, I can see that P is a person. But when I actually execute the code, something else could come in. A student, a teacher, a college student. That is the runtime data type. I don't know that until runtime, until the program actually starts executing. So we're going to figure out what is this thing exactly. And then here, notice I'm saving it into a string called C for whatever reason. That's not confusing. That's not confusing. Let's fix this. At least call it S. I'm going to save in the name of my class, the runtime data type into this string. And I'm saying, if that string is person, maybe I do this implementation of checkout. If it is student, maybe I do this implementation of checkout. And that may seem like I'm just taking all of those methods and condensing down to one. I'm not really reducing duplicate code, but you could have code before and after part of the book checkout process. And then only parts of it change based on if it's a person or student. Okay, let's actually demonstrate this. I'm in checkout. My library is nonsensical, right? I'm not even taking in a book. I just call the method checkout. We're just taking in a person. I'm going to pull the name, the runtime data type. Right? I'm going to take my person, take a look at the methods I can call. Get first, get last, two string. Did I bring my two string back in? Let's do that. Two string. Equals, I ain't writing an equals method, except I have one. 
we've inherited this one from object. IntelliJ is actually trying to show us uh, kind of the levels here. It's probably hard to see in the video. You can probably see it in your IntelliJ, but these first five methods here, those are defined in person. They're a little bit more bold in IntelliJ. Everything else down here, such as get class, which is what I'm about to call, that's coming from object. The parent class, the super class of person. So I'm going to say person.get class. Now that's going to return a class object. So if I stopped right here, it's mad at me. I'm trying to save in a class into a string. But if I do get name, I don't recall the difference between these two things. If I do get name, that'll give me the name of it. Okay. So what's going to be stored in this is going to be person, student, teacher, or college student is a possibility. Effectively, the runtime data type. Right? Let's make if statements. If str dot equals person, we're going to just print off some stuff, right? Check out the book for a basic person, a normie. Um, else if str equals student check out the book for a student. Okay, you'll notice that this stuff up front is the same, right? That's kind of what I mean by, I, I know this is a very dumbed down method. This is, a, this is ultimately a do nothing method. There'd be a lot more stuff here in practice, but this is what I mean by duplicate code. This is duplicated, this is duplicated. We can extract that and do an advance, right? I can do the S out up here, except it's going to be just a print. I would, uh, I would in practice do a, an actual string. String print me check out the book for a, and we leave it at that, right? So instead of printing, I'm going to say print me plus equals normie. Print me plus equals student. Else if it's a teacher, we do print me teacher. Else, if I leave it at an else, we're assuming that we only have these four things in our class hierarchy. We're going to print off a, we'll add the college student. So at the very end, this is the other side. This is, this would be duplicate code as well. We're just going to print off print me. Let's try this out. I'm back in my driver. I got a person. It's technically a student. I'm going to call the library method. Do I have to have a, is this an instance thing? Yeah. I need to actually create a library. The method's not static is what I'm getting at. So I'm going to call library dot checkout, passing in my person. Notice IntelliJ is happy. There's nothing wrong here. I run it. And we're going to check out the book for a student, for a student. Awesome. This checkout method is able to take in a person. I gave it a person. Right? The compile time data type of this variable is person. I pass that in. When it gets here, it knows it's a person. All person objects have a get class method. We're able to call that. That was inherited from object. 
we call get name, and that is going to be explicitly one of these four things in theory. If it's person, I do this. If it's student, I do this. So what I'm getting here is the runtime data type. Look at it. This is compile time. I have no idea what this is. This could be any person. In our example, we passed in a student, but it could very easily be a college student. That did not go as planned. I'm going to try running it again. Right? Check out a book for a normie. Now, something of note. I don't even know if we cover this in our inheritance. What if I change this to a student? <coughs> Bless me. And we do this. Nothing's mad. I'm going to tell it to run. My checkout method, what is, what is quirky here? What is interesting? My checkout method says it takes a person. I'm very blatantly giving it a student. The compile time data type is student. The runtime data type is student. And this is perfectly fine. Notice here, it's going to be treated as a person. Meaning if I try to call like get ID or get GPA, they're not available. This thing's a person. It's going to be treated as such. Okay. That is going to probably be a good spot to pause because this was information dense. I'll see you in the next one.